What uh, is now clear is that the lack of political will has not allowed many of the governments in this world to not only fulfill what was promised in Paris, but to commit to this carbon neutrality in 2050. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It's an honor and privilege to be joined here by His Excellency Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations. The Forum has always, since many years, worked closely together with the United Nations. But under your leadership, Secretary General, we have together advanced in another important milestone last year in establishing a strategic partnership framework between the United Nations and the World Economic Forum. Secretary General, I'm pleased to report that as a consequence of this framework agreement we have inaugurated during this meeting, AppLink, a digital platform allowing all people, particularly the young generation and startup companies, to contribute and exchange ideas and initiatives to advance the social, the sustainable development goals. I'm also pleased to report that we have made substantial progress during this meeting in making stakeholder responsibility mainstream through the development of a comprehensive ESG, environmental, social, good governance measurement system. By making stakeholder engagement measurable, we will make it credible. And finally, significant progress is being made in addressing one of the key challenges of humankind, very much discussed during this meeting, climate change. Catalyzed by our Climate Action Summit, by your Climate Action Summit in September, we made during this meeting major advances on the initiatives for accelerating industry, energy, and financial transition. Also during this meeting, we launched a platform for public-private cooperation for reforestation. In doing so, we want to make a special contribution to the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. Mr. Secretary General, I'm delighted to invite you again to share with us your views on the state of the world and your vision for how we can work together to create a better world for future generations, despite all the challenges we, and particularly you, have to face. This will be followed by a conversation with my colleague, Berge Brenn, the President of the World Economic Forum. So, now the show is yours, uh, Secretary General. Uh, we are very pleased to have you back here, and uh, you made such a huge impression on everyone uh, last year. So, floor is yours, uh, the world according to the Secretary General. Well, thank you very much, and I first of all uh, express my deep gratitude to, to Chairman Klaus Schwab and to President Borge Brende for the fantastic cooperation that uh, the World Economic Forum has been providing to the United Nations in some of the key aspects of our work. And at the same time, to congratulate you on uh, uh, your anniversary. I mean, 50 versus 75, we are a little bit older, but uh, uh, we look at our young uh, brother uh, with a, a lot of uh, uh, sympathy, a lot of uh, commitment, and uh, a lot of best wishes for the extraordinary work that World Economic Forum has been doing. Thank you, obrigado. Now, if I had to use two words to describe the state of the world, it would be uncertainty and instability. Uh, in my address to the General Assembly yesterday, I mentioned uh, uh, the four horsemen that are around us and represent uh, huge challenges for our common future. And the first is climate change. Climate change is indeed, for me, the defining issue of our time. For the first time in the history of humankind, there is a limit, a physical limit, to our perspectives of development. 
And uh, this has led uh, humankind to declare a war to nature, and nature is striking back, uh, and striking back in a very violent way, as we have seen uh, in different parts of the world. Now, uh, it is absolutely essential to recognize that climate change is an existential threat to us all, and that climate change is running faster than what we are. We are not winning this war, and we absolutely must do it. I know that for some people there is this idea, well, climate change is probably something to take into account in the future, uh, and the planet is very resilient, and the planet uh, will not be destroyed. I fully agree. The planet will not be destroyed. In uh, uh, the next uh, few centuries and millennia, we will see the planet around the sun. What will be destroyed is our capacity to live in this planet. We will be destroyed by climate change, not the planet. And uh, this uh, will be for us uh, a clear indication that we absolutely need to change course. Now, we are seeing the impacts today. We have the highest level of concentration of CO2 uh, since 800 million uh, ago. We had the last decade, the hottest decade. Uh, we see the temperature of the water in the oceans and the temperature uh, inland rising at a rhythm that has no parallel in, in the recent past. We are always registering uh, records uh, in all these aspects, but especially the dramatic impact that we are seeing in relation to uh, natural disasters and their horrible humanitarian implications and economic implications. What we are seeing in relation to the factors of insecurity with the, the lack of resources caused by prolonged drought, um, making farmers and herders uh, fight and uh, contributing to the instability in areas like the Sahel where climate change is objectively supporting terrorist activities. Uh, when we see all the other dramatic implications that climate change is having. Uh, look at the fires that occurred in the Arctic, uh, Siberia, but also in uh, uh, Greenland and Canada. Now uh, what we have seen in, uh, in Australia. All this makes us think that it is indeed a climate crisis and a climate emergency now. Now, the good news is that the scientific community has told us exactly what to do. We need to make sure that temperatures do not grow above 1.5 degrees at the end of the century, and we need to make sure to reach that objective, that we have carbon neutrality 2050, and that we reduce in the decade ending in 2030 uh, the emissions by about, as an average, 45% in relation to the levels of 2010. But if one looks at what was agreed in Paris, the commitments in Paris will still lead to increase the temperature in 3 to 4 degrees, and that is catastrophic. And if you look at the portfolio of um, asset management uh, entities that uh, uh, are working with us and want to shift resources from the grey economy to the green economy, they still recognise that their present portfolios represent a global economy that is moving to an increase of temperature of 3 to 4 degrees, which means there must be a meaningful shift of resources from fossil fuel companies from the grey economy to what it is the green economy, renewables and different other areas of activity that are the ones that have future in our world if we want to be able to preserve um, the, the values that uh, we have been fighting for. What uh, is now clear is that the lack of political will has not allowed many of the governments in this world to not only fulfill what was promised in Paris, but to commit to this carbon neutrality in 2050. We have seen many small countries doing so, small island states. 70 countries did so in the summit that we had in September. Uh, we see now the European Union, and I would like to underline that, uh, with a very strong commitment to carbon neutrality in 2050. There is still the problem of Poland to be solved, but we all believe it will be solved on time. But the great, the big emitters have not yet committed to do so. The big emitters are absolutely essential because if the big emitters do not rally the group of carbon neutrality in 2050, we will be doomed because they represent a very important share. The G20 represents 
of the emissions uh, uh, that uh, contribute to climate change. And so it is in the big emitters, and namely in some aspects like the addiction to coal, particularly in Asia, that we need to act in order to make sure that we do not become doomed in all the efforts that the international community is doing. And there are many things that can be done on this. We need to put a price on carbon. It is clear that carbon has today an impact that needs to be priced for markets to be transparent. We need to be able to shift taxation for carbon, from carbon to income, uh, from income to carbon, uh, which has a win-win uh, situation. We need to cut subsidies to fossil fuels. I must say that as a taxpayer, I can't really accept the idea that my taxes are used to boost hurricanes or to bleach corals or to melt glaciers. I mean, uh, uh, I think I have the right to ask that the subsidies that are paid with taxpayers' money do not go to fossil fuels. It doesn't make any sense. It distorts markets and it gives the wrong indications to the private sector. Now, the good news is that I see an enormous commitment of the private sector emerging. And I see the financial institutions more and more, with some exceptions, and we have seen now this debate is uh, uh, not entirely clear yet, uh, even in what happened in the recent days here in Davos, but more and more banks, asset managers, uh, more, more and more central banks are saying that this must be a priority also in their activities. And we see more and more companies recognizing that they themselves must be carbon neutral, and this is something that is very encouraging. And even more encouraging is to see cities doing the same, is to see public opinions doing the same, is to see elections, for instance, elections in Europe one year ago were disputed based on migration. Last year, it was a lot on climate change. So we see electorates emerging, we see uh, public opinions, and we see the youth mobilizing in an extremely important way. So being very worried, because we are still losing this war, we are not yet reversing the trend. We still increased the emissions last year. I'm hopeful that it will be possible to mobilize both the private sector and the public authorities in order to take the transformational decisions in the way we produce our food, in the way we power our economy, in the way uh, we move, in the way we uh, support our industry, that we will be able to do the transformational, in the way we plan our cities, the transformational changes that are necessary for us to reach the objectives that the, the scientific community tell us it's absolutely essential to do so. The second horseman I'd like to uh, refer has to do with the level of disquiet and mistrust that we see everywhere in the world today. 66 countries last year had huge demonstrations, some of them unfortunately turning violent. And what is clear is that the reasons of these uh, situations are different from country to country. I mean, in each the, the pretext uh, is different. But there is an underlying factor mistrust, lack of trust in political establishments, and the perception that there is unfairness in globalization, that globalization is not reaching everybody in the same way, and that inequality is growing in many of our societies. As a matter of fact, seven uh, in ten people in the planet live in countries where inequality is growing at the present time. Now, this has generated uh, 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 the kind of movement that obviously is very important, but must remind us that we need to guarantee two things. First, that governments understand that they must give voice to their people, they might give ways for people to participate, they must respect the civic space that unfortunately has been put into question in so many areas around the world, they must respect the freedom of press that has also been put in question in many areas of the world, and they must give a voice particularly to the young people and create the conditions also for gender equality, which is an absolute must in relation to the creation not only of just societies, but effective societies in development and in guaranteeing the conditions for peace and stability. But the second thing we need is really to work together for a fair globalization. And it's very encouraging to see the World Economic Forum in the front line of these efforts. To put civil societies, governments and businesses working together in order to make sure that we reap all the benefits of globalization but do it in a way in which everybody can benefit. 
which means that the Sustainable Development Goals, which means that the Agenda 2030 should become a master plan for the development plans of each country in the world, and also an important reference for the way businesses plan their own activities. And it's, as I said, very encouraging to see the enthusiasm with which so many actors at local level, at national level, in the business community, in the civil society, are indeed adopting the Sustainable Development Goals as their reference in their own campaigns, in their own actions, and in their own uh, uh, activities. But uh, let's be clear, we are lagging behind. If everything would go on as it is today until 2030, we would be halfway. We need to accelerate. And to accelerate, we need to make a huge effort, both in relation to the seriousness of our commitments, but also in relation to the mobilization of resources. Mobilization of resources for climate change. It's not enough to be ambitious on, ambi on, on mitigation. We need to be ambitious on, on adaptation and on finance and ambition also in relation to the financing of the Sustainable Development Goals, of the creation of conditions for countries to be able to uh, increase their uh, capacity to raise their own resources, uh, support them uh, in relation to money laundering, uh, um, uh, tax evasion, illicit flows of capital that are uh, uh, drawing resources from them. And this is a responsibility of the international community as a whole, uh, making sure that uh, international financial institutions fully play their role, making sure that we have innovative forms of financing, uh, social impact bonds, green bonds, making sure that, uh, uh, that we have also instruments to de-risk private investment, making sure that governments assume also the responsibility of good governance, of the rule of law, of fighting corruption for private investors to feel that they are ready to risk in the developing world. So there is a lot that still needs to be done to mobilize the international community for the sustainable development goals to be a reality. Two brief references, and we will have time to discuss, and I don't want to monopolize in this first intervention, to the two other horsemen. First, the increase of tension, the increase of geopolitical tension in the world. It is a factor that we have seen dramatically in the potential conflict in the Gulf that fortunately it was possible to avoid. Uh, it is something that we see in the dysfunctionality of the relations between the major powers, uh, namely in the Security Council and in the inability of the Security Council to take decisions and address the crises that we face and allow us to solve them or prevent the emergence of new ones. Uh, the dysfunctionality also in relation to trade and uh, uh, in relation to technology that risks uh, a great fracture in the world. Uh, we need uh, a global economy. We need uh, multilateral institutions to be in charge, both of the governance at peace and security level and at the governance at uh, the level of uh, um, uh, trade and at the level of technology. And the last uh, uh, is exactly related to the dark side of the technological evolution, especially the digital world, where I recognize that there has been a very important leadership at World Economic Forum, both in relation to the preparation of member states uh, of the United Nations and of societies to the impacts of the fourth industrial revolution, but also in relation to drawing the attention to the need to put some order in what the, is the chaos today of the cyberspace and also to make sure that artificial intelligence becomes a force for good. And uh, in all these, we have been working together and fully appreciative of the excellent work that World Economic Forum is doing. And uh, it is my deep belief that uh, we need to be able to boost international cooperation and we need to be able to recognize that these global challenges can only be solved through a global response. And the global response requires international cooperation and multilateral institutions but not the traditional multilateral institutions working in traditional ways. And when I think about the UN, I see more and more a UN that I want, being a UN working in network with all other international organizations. When you look at the Sahel, it's working with the African Union, with ECOWAS, with World Bank, that we can provide an answer to the Sahel. When we uh, look into the technologies, working with economic, World Economic Forum, absolute must for us to be able to be effective in the way we address things after the high-level panel um, that I appointed has produced the, the, the conclusions. Networking is essential for multilateral organizations to be effective and inclusive multilateralism. We have traditionally a very intergovernmental approach to international organizations and governments are very keen on keeping that as such. 
But the truth is that governments control less and less of the collective life of countries. More and more local authorities are relevant, regional authorities are relevant, the civil society is relevant, the business community is relevant, and we must give voice to them also inside the multilateral organizations and make the multilateral organizations reflect the anxieties, the aspirations and the objectives of those that build our societies and contribute to what can be an effort, a global effort, to make these four horsemen go home. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary General, and also thank you for the well wishes for the forum's uh, 50th anniversary. Of course, we also wish the UN a uh, happy 75th anniversary, and there is so many challenges uh, to um, deal with, so there is not a lot of time for celebration. It is really rolling up the sleeves, like the Secretary General now also indicated, on all these really pressing issues. I think there is, Secretary General, um, a lot of concerns also among uh, the participants in Davos on the escalation we have seen lately uh, in conflicts and also proxy wars. Earlier uh, during um, the summit, uh, our annual meeting, I said that we're moving from a cold war to hot peace, but I was corrected uh, by one of the participants saying, no, we move from cold war to hot proxy wars. Seen from you, your viewpoint, how can we uh, together de-escalate these conflicts that we're seeing? Is there a way to stop these proxy wars and uh, making sure that the world get more peaceful? We are trying hard. And um, uh, we have made huge efforts in Yemen, we have made huge efforts in Libya, we have made huge efforts in Syria, in Syria. We are trying hard. But uh, what we now see more and more is that conflicts are no longer conflict between two countries, that are countries with conflicts within a country. And as soon as a conflict within a country emerges, different interests of neighbors and sometimes of more far away actors start to get involved. And in the first phase, getting involved, supporting in different uh, forms of uh, help the parties to the conflict, but then all of a sudden getting directly engaged. And uh, this is the reason why, for instance, in the case of Libya, I believe the Berlin Conference was possible and that the conclusions with the Berlin Conference could be positive, even if this is just the beginning and it's uh, uh, impossible to predict whether we will be successful or not in the end. Because what we have seen in Libya was that we moved from a, a, a war by proxy to a situation in which those that were supporting the forces, the local forces, are getting themselves involved directly in the conflict. And so, to a certain extent, strangely, the concept of deterrence worked. And it was possible to gather all these countries to the same table and to say, well, better to stop this before it's too late and before you get really involved in a war among yourselves. Uh, now, uh, it is absolutely essential to increase our diplomatic efforts. It's absolutely essential to work very closely together with regional organizations and to push neighbors and other actors into the understanding that these conflicts in the end are terrible, not only for the countries themselves, but for the region, and many of them are supporting this new phenomenon of global terrorism. Uh, fighters that move from one country to another. We see now uh, fighters that came from Syria to uh, Libya. There were many others already there. We see that uh, Libya has been one of the um, feeding, uh, uh, one of the feeding uh, instruments of the conflict in the Sahel. The conflict in the Sahel and the, its connection to Lake Chad is such that today I cannot say that we are winning the war against terrorism in Africa. Terrorists are moving forward, are having an enlarged area of intervention, are getting closer to the countries of the coast, which is something that is very worrying. And we see similar phenomena in Eastern Congo, we see similar phenomena in Mozambique. So we see something spreading and the capacity we have to control it is limited. The different instruments of security we have are limited. The response about root causes, about development is limited. 
And so, to really address those conflicts, like Libya, that are not only a drama in themselves, but that the kind of a cancer that spreads into other areas is absolutely essential. But it has been very difficult. And here, let's be clear, we have another problem. Power relations in the world became much more unclear. We no longer live a bipolar world. We no longer live a unipolar world. But this is not yet a multipolar world. This is a chaotic world. And we see lots of actors of the uh, middle dimension becoming spoilers uh, in different conflicts. And to a certain extent, nobody is afraid of anybody. Uh, and this creates an environment in which it's very difficult to make uh, the, uh, diplomatic efforts to uh, end the conflict succeed. Um, uh, it, uh, we need, I think multipolarity is a positive thing. But multipolarity in itself is not a guarantee of peace and security. Europe was multipolar before the First World War, and in the absence of multilateral institutions of governments, the result was the First World War. So we need simultaneously a multipolar world, but we need multilateral institutions able to provide the forms of governance that are necessary. And today, one of the dramas of this lack of clarity in relations, in, in power relations, and the fact that the relations between the biggest powers are so dysfunctional is that the Security Council is not able to implement its own decisions. I think something that is absolutely unacceptable is to see a Security Council resolution with an arms embargo in Libya and everybody sending publicly arms to Libya. These arms and other things. So there is here something that really requires uh, as I said, it's not enough to say multilateralism is the solution. We need multilateralism that works, and we need to create the conditions for that to be possible. Thank you very much. In many ways, uh, we are faced with a non-polar world for the time being, leading to uh, some the of... G0. Yeah. Uh, results, as, as you indicated. Thank you also um, very much, uh, Secretary General, as also mentioned by Professor Schwab. Uh, last summer, uh, we signed this strategic partnership between the United Nations and the World Economic Forum. And uh, you also mentioned um, the new technologies, the fourth industrial revolution, the SDGs, and I think uh, we easily agree that without also mobilizing uh, the private sector and the business community, uh, we will have big challenges meeting uh, the targets that are set. And it's very good to see here during our Davos meeting that many companies have come out and said that we will go carbon neutral by 2050. But coming back to the technologies, and um, as you know, uh, we are also working on how we can get a better governance of these new technologies that can do a lot of positive things for humankind, but they also are challenges. And now we see the decoupling of possible two different systems. Uh, the geopolitics are also working on this. So um, how to make sure that these technologies work in the interest of humankind? And are you concerned about two systems? How will that influence also global economic growth and how to avoid that? I do believe, I said it uh, last September in the, in, when addressing the General Assembly, that we face the risk of a great fracture. I mean, we have two biggest economies in the world that are much bigger than any other one. And uh, these two economies have been uh, uh, relating each other in a way in which we had a trade conflict that has now had a kind of a lull with this uh, first agreement. But let's be clear, this first agreement doesn't solve any of the key problems uh, that uh, uh, are, have to be resolved. But uh, more important than trade for me is technology, is the divide in technology. And we see it already. And so um, uh, the risk is uh, if things go on in a negative way, and let's hope it's not the case, that we have two poles that uh, uh, act as magnets, attracting other countries and making the global economy divided into two, with two sets of rules, with two internets separated from each other, with two completely different strategies in the way artificial intelligence is integrated in uh, the life of societies and the life of the economy. And uh, inevitably, when this happens, sooner or later, we have uh, the uh, different uh, and opposing military and geostrategic uh, 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 approaches. So I think it's absolutely vital to do everything possible to preserve one global economy, to preserve uh, uh, one global set of rules, and to preserve the multilateral institutions responsible for it. 
and integration to technology to create new mechanisms that allow for, uh, I would say, traditional regulation, that would not be possible in my opinion, but forms of international cooperation that allow those uh, uh, new technologies, namely the cyberspace, artificial intelligence, to be a force for good. My approach, and I think the UN can be a platform when people can come together, and uh, what to a certain extent comes from the conclusions of the level panel I appointed, is that what we need is not a convention that is established by all states and then it is ratified uh, during uh, two or three or four years and the moment it uh, enters into function, uh, the technology has evolved in such a way that the convention no longer serves any purpose. What we need is a permanent way in which governments, companies, researchers, civil society come together and establish a number of norms, protocols, uh, define some red lines, uh, at the same time exchange best practices and create mechanisms of the cooperation. The Internet Governance Forum is one of them, but we can have others. Mechanisms of cooperation allowing for, um, we will not be able to avoid everything, but at least to make sure that the mainstream moves in the right direction and moves in the right direction with everybody on board without this fracture that could be uh, uh, very, very destructive. But let's be clear. We have a number of problems that not be, have been solved. How does international humanitarian law and international human rights law apply to, for instance, cyber attacks? To what extent the basic concepts that are today uh, the, the legal foundations of war and peace, like the right of self-defense, how does it apply to a cyber attack? There are a number of things that need to be seriously discussed, and some of them, in my opinion, will require uh, some uh, capacity of states coming together and making some bans or taking some other uh, enforcement, creating some other enforcement mechanisms because it would be too dangerous to let things just go uh, in a more uh, voluntary way. But in my opinion, the key instrument is international cooperation, multi-stakeholder cooperation with soft and flexible and uh, mechanisms that evolve with time and adapt to the changes that technology itself uh, uh, will inevitably have. Thank you. Last question, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, last year, um, when we sat here, you said that it is a big paradox that uh, the more and more the world gets integrated and globalized, the more and more fragmented our responses. Um, I was thinking, being Secretary General, I think you feel also the warmth from the public here. Everyone wants the United Nations and multilateralism, uh, at least I, I think many of the sitting here wants to succeed, you hear. But I was just reflecting on, it has to be a very difficult job being Secretary General in such a polarized world. You know, has, of course, the importance of the UN is even more so, but how to maneuver when uh, the world is so polarized and you see the big powers also um, not uh, seeing each other um, in the eyes every day. Can you reflect well, just I, shortly on I, that I and am, how you handle it? I am it? an engineer. Yeah. And from an engineer point of view, the more complex situations are, the more simple the answers must be. Now, when you have such a mess, first tell the truth to everybody. Because it's impossible today to tell one thing to one country, another thing to another. I mean, it, it doesn't work. Tell the truth to everybody. And don't ask permission, if necessary, apologize. So what we have tried to do is to keep a number of initiatives on board. I mean, we launched an agenda for disarmament. We launched a reform of peacekeeping called Action for Peacekeeping. We had not everybody on board. We had 150 countries on board, but we moved onwards. We launched uh, now a, uh, an initiative uh, of uh, mobilizing the UN against aid speech, the same in relation to the protection of religious sites. We have a counter-terrorism strategy, and we are going to launch uh, a second conference in relation to the victims of terrorism and how to better organize the international community to support victims of terrorism. We launched a very ambitious program of uh, parity uh, in the UN itself. 
and the gender equality in our policy around the world. And this is not obvious. There are lots of pushback in relation to these things. But we move onwards and we go on. And I can tell you now that we have already parity at the level of the full-time political appointees, and the Secretary Generals and the Assistant Secretary Generals, which I had promised to 2021. But we moved forward. And we, uh, the same in relation to, the same in relation to uh, 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 initiatives uh, in human rights. I will be launching uh, a new call for action in human rights uh, uh, in uh, February in uh, Geneva. Uh, we, uh, I mean, we need to taking into account that how difficult it is to bring together uh, all member states uh, and to create the conditions for uh, effective action in the same number of areas to do everything we can with what we really are able to do, which is use our good offices and use our capacity to mobilize actors, be platforms where people can come together and make things move. Sometimes we manage, sometimes we fail, but one thing you can be absolutely sure, we will not sit quiet expecting a consensus of the international community to solve the problems we have been discussing. Thank you so much.